uh, today, I had I had a message ready a few weeks ago uh, when Pastor Troy was out of town and it got canceled and it had to do with government. Now, this is not a real popular subject because uh, I know there's a lot of people out there who don't believe in government. They don't like the government. They don't like our, some people don't like our current president. So, <clears throat> So my opinion on this matter doesn't matter. I'm not going to bring that to the pulpit. But there is an opinion. We're going to start in Romans 13 here in just a minute. We're not going to go there yet. God says a few things about government, about governing authorities and the people that He puts in charge, even if it's someone that the ones in this room, we don't like them. The book of John talks about it, and Romans 13 talks about it, that He's placed people in charge. That even if we don't, it's somebody we don't like and we think that it's somebody awful, why don't, we, why don't we go to Scripture before we immediately say we reject this person, we're not going to pray for them, we're not going to support them. Now, there may be a majority of you in here that don't like our current president. But, so I'm probably on board with the rest of you, but we need to, make, we need to understand that the Bible tells us how to deal with that. And if we're going to be Bible-believing Christians, we're, we're to honor the Scripture. And so we're going to talk about that. Let me baptize my tongue. So I want to start off, read a quick verse in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, pertaining to what I just said. Um, you guys have heard this verse a thousand times. It says, you know, the, uh, the serpent and the enemy and, and Adam and Eve and the enemy were there and the enemy tricked Eve and there was division. Sin entered in and Genesis 3, 15 talks about how God placed something between them. It says, and I will put enmity, which is hatred between you and the woman, thee and the woman between your seed or thy seed and her seed. And that was the first prophecy of Jesus. That was the first mention, the first prophecy of Jesus coming. But what it says, it says, it shall bruise thy head, talking to the serpent, which means to crush. That's a mortal blow. And thou shalt bruise his, bruise his heel. Well, who got his heel bruised on Calvary? Crushed. Think about the stakes. But a head wound's a mortal wound. You don't come back from that. There's a death, there's a physical death, and there's a spiritual death. But what I want to point out is the fact that he said, I'm going to place enmity, that's hatred. Does that mean that God created hatred? No. He took, I don't like to use anything that says created when it comes to Satan, the enemy. But something that the enemy comes up with, I want you to notice that God just moved it over and used it against him. He didn't create it, but he had to eat that fruit that he tried to bring forth. I want you to think about that. So we have fruit that we have to deal with. We may hate, but God uses it as a footstool. Most people think of a footstool as something to, um, to rest your feet on. A footstool is designed to elevate something. And so he uses government, as well as many other things, to elevate something. And so I want you guys to really focus on the message, not whether or not you like our president. Because I know that's the first thing you guys are thinking is our president, or whoever it is. So I'm going to start out by, I'm going to mention three things, if you guys are note takers. There's three things that are divinely, that the Bible mentions that are divinely inspired institutions. Three things that I've found. One of them's church, mentions the church, it's a divinely inspired institution. Family, talks a lot about family, God, family, church. And government, Romans chapter 13, we'll get there. So I'm going I'm to ask a couple of questions before I get started. Would you guys agree that um, God protects us from ourselves sometimes? Right? You know, how about, how about when you guys are in school? This has happened to me. Man, a girl, she's like, oh, makes the heart beat and everything. just feeling good and you're around her. But God's like, nope, she's with somebody else. She's not for you. Or she rejects you. It's like, why? Then you see her 15 years later on Facebook. Dodge that bullet. I think Garth Brooks wrote a song. Uh, what is it? Unanswered prayers. How does it go? Thank God for unanswered prayers. Sometimes our blessing is when it's not what we think is our blessing. When he says no, thank you, Jesus. He says no because he said no to me. I have heard. And other areas. And so the what I want to mention is 
The, question, the first question is, wouldn't you agree that God protects us from ourselves at times? Here's an example of that. Little kid by the stove, this tall, reaches its hand up to touch the burner. It doesn't see that the burner is red hot. I'm leading to something here. But the mom walks by and she can see the top, the top view of the burner looking down. It's red hot. Mom swats the baby's hand out of the way. The first thought of the kid is, why would you do that? Why would you hit my hand? Why would you hurt me? Why, why would there be government? Why would somebody control me from a different perspective? Now, I know a lot of you people, I know a lot of people in here, and this was me at one time. You guys have all said this. I can't stand the cops. Somebody at one time in their life, when they were younger, didn't like the cops. They didn't like the authority of the police. Would everybody agree with me? Maybe you got a ticket. Maybe you feel like they were singling you out. Maybe you felt like you were being, this is a lot of people, not everybody. But I've heard people say they don't like the police for whatever reason. They got in trouble, they got arrested, they got stopped for speeding, whatever. They're mad at the police. But what's worse than a really bad... <laughs> that's you. That's you. <laughs> so this isn't everybody, but a lot of people I've spoke to in my past life, they don't, they don't like the police. So, what's that? That's hard. So, here's my question. What's worse, a really bad, I'm going to use the term cop, a really bad, what's worse than a bad cop? Anybody know? Right, that's good, yeah. No cop. A lot of people out there, not all of us here, of course, badmouth the police until we need them. Somebody's at your door, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, your husband's gone, oh God. But I thought you didn't like the cops yesterday. God gave us commandments, not so we'd keep them, which sounds kind of counterproductive. He gave us commandments because there's 613 written like uh, oral laws for the Jews and 10 commandments. He gave us commandments so that we'd have moral laws and we wouldn't kill each other. The commandments were designed to be reflections so we could look at the laws that we can't keep and say, ooh, we're sinners, we need a redeemer. That's why it was written. So we have government, we have law in place so we don't kill ourselves or other people. This is, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't murder, you shouldn't uh, commit adultery. You know, if you, if you commit adultery, then that man comes over and kills you. I mean, they all go in order. They all cause morality failure, death. Is it possible that God's answer to our prayers could be the prayers that we, that we, the ones he doesn't answer, like I said? Um, so the question I have first to you guys, does God ordain leaders who are bad? Listen to the wording of my question. Anybody out there, does God, or, does God ordain leaders that are knowingly bad? I didn't say that he make them bad. Can he appoint them? Can he place them where he needs them? Anybody? Of course. I'm going to give you an example that's not popular. I want you guys to think about somebody by the name of Adolf Hitler. Killed at least six, six million Jews or more. Did God, do you think that God ordained someone like that to be in charge? I want you to listen to it carefully. It doesn't sound really popular, that question. Does he want Hitler to be in an office that he's going to have Jews killed? Of course not. He doesn't want bad things to happen. But does he use something as a footstool sometimes? I want you to think about something. Adolf Hitler's oppression against the Jews is what caused Israel to be established in 1948. It's what brought it about. Because of the world's sentiment at the time towards the Jewish people, because of the persecution and Hitler's atrocity at the end of World War II, that's what, that's what stemmed and that's what, that's what started the regathering of Jerusalem, of Israel. I'm not saying that he, that he uh, wanted Hitler to do what he did, but he used someone in charge for something else or how about this scenario? I say this all the time. Imagine you have a son. Okay, and he's, this actually happened to me when I was in the tattoo business. You have a five-year-old boy, and he's on a church bus on a youth trip. Bus flips over. Everyone on board survives except for your son. He dies. You're the pastor of the church. You could go, wow, I've been serving my whole life. I'm a Christian, but my son dies and everybody else survives. What kind of God is that? Why would he let something like that happen to my kid? 
It's pretty bad. But what we don't realize from our perspective, just like the stove perspective, is that that little boy, God knew, every, does God know everything in advance? Because he stands outside of time, so he's not in a linear view of everything like we are. We're constricted by time. We have a body. When you take our bodies away, we're eternal. We see everything from the top. There's no beginning and ending. God's like that. He's outside of time. So he knows in advance that that five-year-old boy, that you're like, God, why'd you take my boy away? God created that boy. You didn't. He knows that boy, 24 years, is going to become a pilot. And he's going to become a military pilot, a commercial pilot. That little boy will be flying 315 military soldiers over to Afghanistan who saved the life of the people in this country. But, unfortunately, that little boy, when he was flying the plane, had a heart attack and it went down. Everyone perished. See the picture change? God knew that would happen. He had a purpose for that little boy in heaven. We don't own him. But he had a bigger plan in that case. By the way, because that little boy went to be with Jesus early, someone else flew the plane, they made it, and they saved the life of thousands of people. You guys get my point? He has the purpose. He knows what he's doing, even if we can't see it from our perspective. The same thing goes for government. We have a president, President Biden. I know how things look right now. But I think God has a plan, and he's going to use our current president. Again, I'm not taking sides on who I choose. That's not the point. The Bible tells us how to handle our current leaders, and we're going to talk about that. If we want to honor him and not ourselves. So Psalms chapter, we'll go ahead and go to open your books, your Bibles to Psalms 110 verse 1. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Good deal. Psalms 110 verse 1 says, A psalm of David, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We talked about that. They're to elevate something. Go ahead and uh, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13 verse 1. That's where we're going to start. So I told you, government's not a popular discussion. Leadership. Well, we're going to break this down. We're going to look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1. We're going to spend some time here, and I want you guys to think about what I'm going to say, or what the Scripture says. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. I'm not using King James. You guys okay with that? Are you using New King James up there? Okay. It says, let every soul be subject. And that, that means anything that breathes life. Anything, any soul. Be subject. That word subject comes from the word hupotasso. And it means, to, it's, a, it's a, something they use in the military. It means to get up underneath and get under the authority, willing subjection under your leader. That's what it means. So he says, let every soul, every, everything living, be subject, be underneath, be willing, under the higher powers. What are the higher powers? For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of, God, ordained of God. So there's no power but of God. What does that mean? God has the only governing authority, only power, correct? He is the ultimate power. First part of that sentence. And he says, there's no power but of God. So anything that has power, strength, or anything comes from God. All things made through Him, for Him, by Him. Nothing that's given isn't from Him. And then it says, colon, the powers that be, current powers, leaders, governors, presidents, current, the powers that be are ordained. Now this power, is, uh, the word for the power here is exousia. Okay? They're ordained of God. So the powers that be who govern us, our president, our senators, our legislature, don't get me wrong, there's some bad ones. We'll get to that. According to this, he says, listen, be subject, understanding that God is the ultimate power, and there's nothing that has power uh, that, we, that we submit to that wasn't given by Him, which we submit to. So we're submitting to Him by submitting to that. But then it says, 
ordained of God. And, I, and I, to me, that points to our leaders, whoever the leader is. So we have this thing, uh, we have what's called dual citizenship. Can you guys hear me good on this? Okay, can you guys hear me better this way? Okay, let me turn this off. Yeah, that was awful. Okay, so we have dual citizenship, and I'll explain what I mean by that. We're citizens of earth and citizens of heaven. What I mean by citizens of earth, earth is the governing realm right now while we're here. Um, and then citizens of heaven, if you read Philippians, if you, guys, if you want to go ahead and pull up Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible tells us we're citizens of heaven. So we have what's called a dual citizenship, while we're here at least. So we have two governing authorities, right? The first one is what? God, heaven. The second one is where? It says it, we'll show you in Scripture. Here. Our leader's here. Right now, we live in two places at once. Well, let me take that back. Somebody will call me out on that. Right now, our governing authority is obviously heaven. It's God in heaven. But we're also also under the authority of man right now in our governing authorities. So we, we carry a dual citizenship at the moment. So um, we should learn to live responsibly in both of them. Or there's chaos. There's an, is it called anarchy? Is that it? Anarchy. See, at the time this was written, Caesar and Nero was the governing authority. Um, we won't get into that. Well, Caesar eventually, you know, we've talked a lot about Paul, but Caesar would go on to behead Paul in this part of Romans after this. Caesar was in charge and he would behead Paul for what Paul did. Uh, based on his opinion. So, I'm going to go ahead and pull up John chapter 19, verse 11. Yes. John chapter 19, verse 11. It's my favorite gun. I like that, that verse. Um, it says, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me. You guys remember the story? When, remember, remember uh, he was brought before Caesar, and they're basically like, you know, I can do whatever I want to you right now. And, and Jesus is like, listen to this. This is, this is a reference from John. Jesus is basically saying, any power that you have, my Father gave you. Because you guys know that angels could have taken him off the cross. He could have walked at any time. I always hear that we killed Jesus. No, we didn't. His love killed him. He ch look, listen, we didn't, t uh, we didn't kill him. He gave it. He gave his life to us. He chose, I'll tell you what did kill him, the fact that what we did to him, by let, the way we've sinned against him, the fact that his love was so constrained that he was willing to give himself up for us just to show us he loved us. That's, we didn't kill him, but we caused him to choose to die. But believe me, we didn't take him. No one takes him. He has all power. And so he said, uh, in John 19.11, he says, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, I love Jesus, except if it were given to thee from above. Just like being born again, it means from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee has the greater sin. Now what does that mean? The people that delivered Jesus to Pilate, they're the ones that rejected him, right? The Jews at the time. Pilate, even though he chose an office that was probably not, not a healthy, not a good office to be in, Jesus is trying to make the point to Caesar, listen, I'm going to say it in my words. You're in a position, let's say when people, there's executioners, right? The death penalty. God talks about this. Genesis 8 talks about it in other places about the death penalty. Whether you like it or not, it is in the Bible. The death, death, I wasn't even a person that supports death penalty, but it's in the Bible, whether I like it or not. He tries to tell Caesar that, listen, you're here doing what you're basically, in my words, you're here doing what your job entails you to do. Now, he has to make a choice whether to call him out to death or not, but the people that persecuted me, that sent me to you, they're in higher judgment. You follow me? You're doing what your role entails you to do. So I want you to go ahead and do what, you, what, you're, what you're called to do. Does that make sense? He didn't make the decision the Jews did. That's what he's trying to say. We'll go ahead and turn to Romans 13, 2. It says, Whosoever therefore resists the power resists the ordinance of God. If you resist what he says, that he has all the power, then you're, you're disregarding him. 
And they that resist shall res uh, receive to themselves damnation. That means judgment or condemnation. That's pretty clear. He has the power. If we resist him by resisting who's in charge, it's the same thing as resisting him if he's put him there. Now, there's exceptions. We'll get to that. So there's this thing called church and state. Who's heard of separation of church and state? Who here thinks that church and state, I'm not going to call anybody out, is about keeping the church out of the state's business? Because that's false. That's a false teaching. That is not what church and state was about. Matter of fact, the reference of church and state, I'm going to have my wife put something up for you guys in just a minute. The reference of church and state is not in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. None of that. It's not an official document whatsoever. Isn't that right, Brother Roy? It was. It was in a letter, and I'll talk to you about it. Separation of church and state is this really famous misquoted thing like many other religious things that are misquoted. So we tend to think that the church has no business to be in the state's affairs. It's the opposite. It's the opposite, and I'm going to show you. It's not in the Constitution Declaration. It's not in any of the state laws. Um, the phrase originated, there was this group of people called the, uh, the, Danbury, the, the Danbury Baptists out of Connecticut. And it was known that Thomas Jefferson at that time was kind of like, even though I hate the word religion, he was kind of an unreligious president, and they kind of knew that he wasn't really into like church stuff as much as the other ones. And they were concerned about it, so they wrote a letter October 7th of 1801 to George, a private letter to George Washington. They're like a, an elite group of people, right, Baptists. And the letter basically said, uh, hey, because they knew kind of who he was. They're like, we don't want to lose our right to worship. We don't want somebody to come in and dictate what we're doing and try to have one speaker, one, uh, what's it called when one person is in charge of um, uh, democracy? Uh, you call it one person's anarchy. Well, there's another word. Right. They didn't want one person that controls the government to control the church that controls all people's, you know, they don't have your right to worship freely. Dictatorship. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. So, so he wrote a, so this group of people wrote a letter, private letter to Thomas Jefferson concerning the issue. So they were concerned about the government being against him. So um, we're going to go ahead and pull up this letter in just a second. On January 1st, 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote a private letter. This is not a government letter. This is not the Declaration, I'm going to say it again, of independence. This is not in the Constitution, state law, bylaws, any laws. This is a reference. He used a reference that was pointing to one of the first, the first Amendment. It was just a reference to it. And he made a few word statements in this. I'm going to have her put it up of what he wrote. So you're not hearing it from me. And he said, this is his response in 1802 to the letter from Danbury. He says, believing with you that the religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that means you and your God, that he owes account to none other for his faith, meaning to no one, to none other for his faith or his worship, the First Amendment. He's basically pointing to it. He says, you can worship the way you want to worship. It's between you and your God, not the government. And he wrote, and, and at the end of this, he wrote what? Referring to the First Amendment of separation of church and state. He just made a little quote in there, which was not in another, any document, referring to the First Amendment. So someone along the way took this all the way down through the years, and then there was a case. This is pretty awesome. There was a case that was opened up. Um, the Supreme Court, one of the Supreme Court leaders, Hugo Black, had a case referencing that letter, and it was declared in 1947 between Emerson and the Board of Education, and they won a case based on this not government letter. You follow me? And we tend to do that. We tend to take something from somewhere else and try to put it in the Bible. That's exactly what they did. Um, so I have a few verses I want to read. Uh, about governing bodies that don't necessarily have to do with a person, but they have to do with entities. And I'm going to end with a few questions here in just a minute. First Peter chapter two verse thirteen. We're going to go through nineteen. Does somebody want to read? Want to try to read? Yeah, that's going to be. Yeah, First Peter two, verses thirteen through eleven. Well, I can just read. I can excuse me, thirteen through. 
19.11. I can read them, I guess. It would be easier. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. We're going to go all the way. Sorry, I said that wrong. We're going to go all the way to verse 19. I was reading two different things together. I'll go ahead and read it so we get it on the recording. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. It says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Remember we talked about the 613 ordinances of the law? Those are ordinances. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to a king, to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. You know, I want to stop. Remember where I left off. When you guys have somebody babysit your children, now if your kids, let's say you have a 10-year-old, 10-year-old decides to ignore what you said and they got in the cereal and whatever they did, and you ground them, take their phone away. What's worse, a kid that doesn't listen to your authority, or if you have a babysitter there and now there's govern, now you have delegated authority, which one's going to give them in more trouble? If they disregard you or the person you put in charge? It's always the delegated authority. Because not only are you disregarding me, now you're disregarding who I sent. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And he sent someone to us. People. Where did that leave off? 14. Uh, verse 15 then. For so, so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Verse 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, respect, honor the king, pretty black and white. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, reverence, respect. Okay, this doesn't necessarily mean they're talking about slaves the way we imagine slaves. Um, People that that work under them, employees, whatever they, I mean, it could be, there's multi-uses of the word there. Um, Not only the good and gentle, but also to the forward. Verse 19, 1 Peter 2, 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now we're going to go ahead and open up to John chapter 19, verse 9. Y'all awake? I can't tell who's sleeping and who's not out here. How about you back there? You sleeping? All right. What's that? Okay, John chapter 19, verse 9. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate, verse 10, unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? We talked, we're going to get into the port we just talked about. Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee, and I have the power to release thee? It's interesting that Pilate decided to have him scourged and not crucified originally. He's like, we'll just scourge him that way, you know. Maybe they won't want to kill him because they'll see that he's being beaten. He didn't really want to, but he had him scourged. Jesus answered, I love this. He said, thou could have no power at all against me except it were given from thee from above. You have no power over me. Therefore, he that delivereth me in, uh, unto thee has the greater sin. We just talked about that. Jesus tells Pilate, um, God gives all power. There's nothing you can... Listen, if, if he didn't want to be there, if he didn't want you there, you wouldn't be there. You need to know, Pilate, this is my words, you're not in charge of anything. You're not. He could leave at any time, right? Didn't the Bible say that legions of angels could have taken him down? If we think we control anything he does, we're out of our mind. He's our Lord. What's that? He is. Lord means owner. He's our owner. Like landlord, landowner. So a couple examples, more examples of government. We'll we'll get to the good part here. Uh, We're going to go to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. That's a serious crowd tonight. It says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. What did you just say? 
Obey God rather than men. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. If you guys could go there for, real quick. A couple more examples of government here. Honoring government. Don't worry, the fun part shows up where we, we, we can reject government sometimes. We're getting there. Yeah. Y'all waiting for that. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It says, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Wasn't it pretty black and white? If not, we'll go to Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus 3, verse 1. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to do uh, to every good work. This is not an exciting study. I mean, nobody wants to follow government. Turn to Jan Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. Yep. Yeah. I would have to I would have to agree, Brother Roy. What's that? Daniel chapter two, verse twenty one. So I like you guys, I'm I'm not a fan of our current current situation, obviously. I, I don't know how you could could not see that. But I know I do know this. Our job as a church body individuals, we have to yes, like it or not, we should be as Christians, whether you like it or not, we should be praying for Joe Biden. It's not popular to pray for your enemies. Did I say is your enemy? It's not popular to pray for anyone you don't like, especially your enemies, but that's what makes a Christian supposedly different than a non-Christian. We do something that's not popular. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Matter of fact, why would Jesus hang on a cross and say, Father, Father, forgive me for they're not what they do. We're killing them, and he's praying for us. He seems to be the perfect example, yet we can't forgive our buddy for doing us wrong. We don't want to. I know I'm definitely guilty of it. Listen, we get in an argument with our wife or a husband. Usually, I'll be honest with you guys, we have our disagreements. Usually, I'm wrong. Probably always. But it's hard. Listen, it's hard when you feel like in that moment that person's the enemy, right? To be able to actually... Sw no, oh, oh, sorry. No. It's that, to actually just say you're sorry, to look the person in the eye and actually mean it, for me, that is the hardest thing in the world to do. Because I'm mad. I'm mad. I don't want to say I'm sorry to you right now. But you know what? We, I, want to, I want to do a sermon on the crucifixion, but it was pretty graphic. We brutally, yes we, even the ones that the Bible says we're guilty under the same transgression as Adam. We brutally, I'm just going to be honest, destroyed Jesus physically. We're a part of that lineage. And he still said, hey, you know what? He couldn't even talk. Think about the, the I'm not going to, think about the seven statements of the cross. The first and the last, he yelled them. If you guys understood, people really, truly understood the gravity of crucifixion. You studied Roman crucifixion and you knew how awful it was just leading up to it. The six, uh, 600 meter walk, the whole thing. If you knew the, the gravity of the crucifixion, the fact that even when you're, on the crucifix, uh, when you're on the crucifix, breathing out is the hard part, not breathing in, when you study it. He had two opportunities. We had many opportunities, but when he uh, said two things, one of them, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know not what they do. His only opportunity, imagine how valuable those breasts were when he breathed them out. And all the pain, we're not going to go into that at all. He didn't ask for a drink of water. He prayed for his murderers. Do you know lambs, when lambs are slaughtered, do you know the typical, when, 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 they, when they gut the lamb, when they, they, I think they usually write about it in here somewhere. You know, you know what the lamb usually does while they're being murdered? Anybody? The lamb reaches down and licks the hand of the person killing him. That's why when you hear that he opened not his mouth, I wanted to preach on this so bad tonight, but I didn't. When he opened not his mouth, 
That's pretty special because what do you say when you're a strong servant on assignment to a destination? There's nothing to say. You're exactly... That's why when Peter tried to get in the way, he said, don't go! Satan. Not Peter. Satan, get behind me. I have to go. His death was not a tragedy. It was a victory. It's a tragedy that we forced him to do it because of his love for us. But it wasn't a tragedy. It was a victory. So when he used those valuable breasts to say, Father, forgive them if I know not what they do. Think of all the things. He could have begged for water. He's dying. He has no energy. He's hyperventilating. He hasn't eaten. He's been up all night. He's had his beard plucked out. He's had sores. He's been beaten 39 times. He's got his skin's tore apart. He walked. I mean, think of all. But what does he do? Father, forgive him. And I can't forgive my wife for having an argument. Even though I'm wrong. I'm usually always wrong. Really think about that. Is it really that hard to forgive? What do you lose? Pride. Pride. Daniel 2.21, I think I read it already, but he's, I'm going to read it again. He changed the times and the seasons. He removed kings and set up kings. He gave wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that no understanding. People sometimes say we don't need... I'm not going to go into that. That's a different day. Um, let me ask you guys a question. This is actually a question. I want to at least have two answers. Are there any times you can think of the, that we are not to listen to government? Anybody? That we don't listen to government? Well, give me an example. Okay. Okay. That's good. Anybody else? Examples when we don't listen to government. Yes. What if they say you can't come in my building if you don't put the mask in your face? Don't go in the building. But there are times, that's good, there are times, Daniel's a perfect example of that, there's many others, there are times to say no to government. You're to follow man's law unless it supersedes God's law. Right? Speeding ticket, were you speeding? Yeah. You get a ticket. That's the law, like it or not. But there are times... If it interferes with something God says. You know, there's a lot of really dedicated Christians that have been beheaded. They've lost their lives. I wish I had this writing. This guy wrote something on the wall. He was going off to be beheaded for his faith in Jesus. It was a foreign country, and he wrote this whole thing on his wall. He said, I prayed up, paid up, and it was a whole, like a, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a whole 20-minute message he wrote on the wall of the cell minutes before they took the guy out to kill him, to behead him. He refused. Oh, I know what it was. They, they, they asked him. Now, this is a question I want to ask you guys. To reject your Lord and Savior, Jesus. Now, I had somebody else ask me, my kid. They said, well, what if somebody comes up to you right now and says, well, if you denounce Jesus, if you don't, I'm going to shoot you in the head. Okay, right. You have one side of the crowd that says, well, I'm not going to say that because there's no reason to be killed. I know in my heart I believe him. Ah, it says, deny me before man, I deny you before the Father. On the other side, I'd like to hope it's us. I'd like to believe, I don't know because I haven't been confronted with it, but I'd like to believe that everyone in this room realizes, go ahead and take the bullet because if you denounce him, it's like denouncing your wife, but way worse. You're saying, I never knew you. Guess what? Shoot me in the head because I'd rather be dead than be alive without him. And if you reject him, he'll reject you before the Father. And that doesn't mean in your mind. That means out loud. Is it a popular? No. Is it going to be uncomfortable? Yes. It's called martyrs. People have been through a lot worse than we have. It's not fun to reject something in the face of death. But a lot of people right now around the world have been burned alive. There's no kids here, right? Burned alive, shot in the face. They've had their heads cut off. Lots of, they've had their skin. There's so many things. Boiled off, tarred and feathered. And they will not reject Jesus Christ. They said, take me. Jesus did the same thing for us. Are there times not to follow government? Well, turn to Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Please. Y'all enjoying this so far? Good. Give you a couple examples. Daniel refused to eat the king's food because of a violation of dietary laws in the nation of Israel. You guys remember that story? 
Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart. I like that word, purposed. Purpose. Anybody know what he's saying he purposed in his heart? Got it over. He, he rolled it around. He didn't just go off the cuff. Correct. So the answer is, even though this may be difficult, if you're confronted with that, yeah, I stand for Jesus. Go ahead and take your shot. Because my life's over anyway if I reject him. That's me. And I'm assuming it's the rest of you guys in here. Yeah, don't threaten me with that. Paul said, don't threaten me with heaven. Right? Is it scary in the natural? Sure. But if you actually believe the way you say you believe, like the people in this room, then when that question presents itself, it should be a difficult uh, thing to face, but not a difficult answer. You shoot me, I'm going to heaven. You're going to hell. Hello. Correct. What she just said is right. If you say that you truly believe, you know where you're going, you believe that Jesus died, buried, resurrected, if you truly believe that right now sitting here, then that question, listen to this carefully. If you actually believe that, speaking to me too, then that question should be very simple. Think about that. It's a difficult question, but what would you do? Like, really faced with it. Well, Jesus tells us you're not going to feel death because he's already died on the cross for that. That's true. That's true. You know, John says the Christian never, this, this is in the Bible, it says the believer, the Christian never dies. That's in Scripture in John. I forget the verse. Somebody can pull it up. So it's not just from my, from my mouth. You know, they call death as they were sleeping. But it says the Christian never dies. The Spirit. I'd rather be born twice and die once than the other way around. I wouldn't like that. So it says he purposed in his heart, Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, and it turns out good for him later, nor with the wine which he drank. <clears throat> Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. He was praying and for praying. But what happened in the lion's den? Come on, you guys, you know. Did they even smell like fire when they got when they tried to burn him? No. Isn't that crazy that he honored God even though a man's law at that time said what he should do? He's like, nope, not doing that. God honored him. Didn't even smell like the flames in the furnace. That's right. It was thrown on the lion's den. Samuel, Samuel didn't want government either. Let's turn to Samuel chapter uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. You guys remember the story of King Saul, not Saul, Paul, Tarsus, but they all wanted a leader. They wanted a king. They didn't understand there was a king, but they wanted a, an earthly king. 1 Samuel 8, uh, verse 4 says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. Verse 5 says, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want a king. We want, a, we want an earthly king. Y'all are missing the boat. Give Caesar what Caesar. Look, if you, wanna, if you wanna be bound by Caesar, we asked for it, so now we're bound by it. Now we have government. It's not what he wanted for us. He said unto him, Behold, um, did I already read verse five? Okay. Verse six says, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, the prophet Samuel. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken, listen to the voice of the people and all that they say unto you, unto thee. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You know that verse that says, It's not you that they hate, it's me. I want you to think about that. The enemy is always after him, not you. Matter of fact, if you think about Satan trying to, he, he hates God, right? You guys agree? But he can't, he can't get rid of him. So what does he do? He's going to go to his children. He's going to try to get to God through us. You know, when you have the black man and the white man and the videotape is taken and there's a racial thing that happens or this happens, 
They want that video to be shown somewhere, although we know racism is a real thing, don't get me wrong, but he wants those videos to be posted on social media so that one person can be offended. They go, look what they did. Oh yeah, go get your homeboys. We're going to go gun them down. Satan's sitting back going, <laughs> they're killing each other. It's funny to him. We're killing each other. So they have rejected thee, but rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Remember, God may grant authority that may seem bad sometimes. People like Hitler, I didn't say he created an evil man, but remember that first verse we opened up with Genesis 3.15? He placed enmity between them. He didn't create it. He moved something that the enemy came up with. He didn't create it. He can't create. He moved it over. I believe people like Hitler, he moves them over. Now, he could stop something whenever he wants to, but if a good God is just and he says we have free will for the, the criminal, the, I always talk about this, the criminal, the good guy, the bad guy, he could stop the bad guy from killing the good guy, but then he's taking the free will from the bad guy. Sure, he could stop whatever he wants, but then he's a good judge, so he says there's justice. right? Romans 6.23 says the gift of God's eternal life, but the wage of sin is death. You don't have to turn there. So there's justice that has to be done. There's government that has to be handled. It's not that he wants it to, but he endorses. He places leaders, even ones we don't like, even Joe Biden, like it or not. If God didn't want, want not want him there, I assure you, he wouldn't be there. So we, we know this. So why aren't we, if you're not, praying for Joe Biden? You don't have to like him. I'm not a fan. I'll be honest. But why aren't we praying for him? If we're not, why aren't we lifting him up? Because our God put him there, whether you like that opinion or not. He wouldn't be there if he didn't. It's not just, oh, it's free will. No, he places government authorities in place. Leaders. We should be praying for Joe Biden. We're Christians. We should be lifting up our government. Let God take care of the rest. We don't have to worry about who's in charge. We should vote. I think we should vote. I haven't done that in the past. I think I will. We should vote. We have an opportunity to have a voice. Sometimes maybe the ballots don't get counted. I don't know, but <laughs> hey, either way, we have an opportunity. But we can't complain if we don't. Can't complain if we don't. But what I, what I don't want to hear, I'm speaking to me, what I don't want to hear anymore, honestly, according to Scripture after doing a study, we should not hear people, honestly, this isn't popular, bad-mouthing our president even though I'm not a fan. We have to lift him up because he is our president right now. And watch God honor it like he does our tithe. You know what I mean? I know it's not fun. It's not fun to apologize to my wife when she's wrong all the time. I mean, I'm wrong all the time. But we need to honor God and do what he says. Let's turn to real quick and we'll be done. Mark chapter 12, verse 17. The story of Samuel was 700 years before Christ, I believe. Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Everybody there? Okay. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Like I told you guys, we, we, we not maybe not us in this room, but we wanted government, the whole story of Samuel. So bad, now we have it. Now we're, You ever heard that saying, uh, live by the sword, die by the sword? We wanted the sword. Now we, we're judged by the sword. Caesar controls our world. Not literally. But, you know, the, for example, the love of money, right? Uh, have I ever told you guys, since I spoke here, the meaning, because we're, we're done right here in just a second. The meaning behind the the, the 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 root of all evil is the the love of money. You guys have heard that. Has anybody heard me talk about that before? I want to tell you guys what that's saying. Have you guys ever wondered why the love of money? Why not the love of um, sex or the love of um, gambling or the love of 
anything, love of anything. Why, why the love of money? Anybody ever wonder, why is that the foundational root of evil? Anybody know? Why the love of money? That's an idol. That's good. Absolutely not a wrong answer. Anybody else? You don't have money, you can't do anything. Right, okay, that's, that's a good answer. If you don't have money, you can't go out and buy drugs, you can't go out and have sex, you can't do anything. You don't have that's money. That's true. So I want you guys, this is, this is uh, the Holy Spirit put this on me, this wasn't in my notes. I want you guys to think about, this is profound. The love of money, not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money. Money is an exchange, a commerce. We use dollar bills, they used to use turtle doves, right? Money is from the root word hammon or mammon in the Greek. You know what that means? More. It's the use of commerce. I'm going to explain this. This is awesome. This will change the way you think. The love of money, the love of money is the foundation or the root of all evil. So the foundation of the root, where's the root in our Bible? Where's the beginning start? The, the garden, right? The love of more was the foundation of evil. Wait a minute. Everything in their garden is yours except for this one tree. It doesn't matter where the actual tree is. It's, a, it's not the point. Just this one, not this one. Satan's like, hold on a minute. Man, he's trying to hold out on you. He doesn't want you to know. He's try- he, he knows everything. He, you, you need to be your own God. Why does he not want you to have that one more tree? It's not enough. I think you need that one too. The foundation of evil was in the garden. It wasn't enough. We needed more. The love of more this is the problem. Money's not a problem at all. It's not that you have money. There's a lot of people that have more money than me. It's never a problem if you have money. It's only a problem if money has you. If you're tied up, I'm not going to get into tithes because that's people have their own opinion of it. The heart behind the tithing message is when your money is more valuable than your faith. That's why if you take away a man's money, you'll see what he's made of. Right? When we offer the tithe, let's say it's 10%, then he can bless the 90. And he says in Malachi, see if I don't bless you. Just, just test me. Because the love of money means, man, I could have had more. But when we hold out on him, we're just worried about what we didn't get. We need that, just that one extra tree. That's the foundation of greed, of everything that's bad. It's not enough. Pornography. My wife's not enough, so I'm going to watch pornography. I don't, the same, right? Or this money's not enough, so I'm going to go steal money. This woman's not enough, so I'm going to go get another woman. You, you see what I'm saying? It's never enough. The foundation of everything that's evil comes from not having enough and not being happy with it. He said, I'm going to repeat it in uh, Mark 12, 17, and Jesus answered, said to them, render to Caesar things that are Caesar's and to God, things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And I, I promise we're, we're just about done here. Acts chapter 5, verse 28, if you could turn there real quick. 28 and 29. Who can read Acts chapter 5, verse 28 and 29? Let me get another water from you real quick. You guys are having a good time yet or what? Acts chapter 5, verse 28, 28 and 29. You want to use a mic and try it? Right, okay. What was that? Wait a minute. So you're saying, hold on. What if man made a law? Did it say, unless there's a, what did it say right here? We should obey God rather than man. Rather than men. There's a thing called common grace There's uh, in human government. Shortly after the flood around Genesis 9, as on most scholars say, God established an institution of human government. After the flood, he gave um, the mandate that whoever sheds a man's blood, we talked about that earlier, Genesis 8, that the man shall also have his blood shed. We talked about that. You guys can read Genesis 8 if you don't agree with me. This isn't, my personal feelings about the death penalty are irrelevant. I don't like the death penalty, but in some cases it's probably needed, but I don't know, who am I, it's not, who am I to say, right? But the Bible says that blood is supposed to be shed because of blood being shed. 
Whether you like it or not, it's in the Bible. It's black and white. Correct. I didn't say a man. If if I feel like I sometimes repeat myself, but if if I come home and I and I witness a, a man assaulting one of my daughters in the backyard, most of the men in the room, we probably wouldn't mean to. We'd accidentally probably what if we walked up on it. Be, be realistic, Brother Batten. Realistic. What would we do? We're not going to say it. Our dad's ship would take over. S H I P. It would take over. We wouldn't even realize it. We would naturally do what dads do, protect our baby. What if you accidentally took a life in the process? Does God say that's allowed? Okay, because there's what we should do and what's, what's popular and what he says. We don't have that authority to take that life. Would I by accident? Maybe. Would you? Maybe. But we're not the governing authority. There are people in place... We're not the governor, senator, legislature. It's not our job to take a life, to go out and we don't have, we're not wearing a badge, we don't have a number, we didn't go to school for it. Whether we want to or not, it's not our job to do that. He has a government to put in place. Genesis 8 talks about government that's put in place to take, and that's why they have, you know, firings. They're actually going to bring the firing squad back in some states. I read about that. That's why there's different people. You never know who, you know, hits the switch or shoots. But. For a man to take over and think that he's the governor? No, God does not permit that. There's a, there's a structure put in place. That's the point. So shortly, uh, we talked about that. After the flood, God gave the mandate to whoever sheds blood demands blood. Also his blood shall be shed. Capital punishment would be the consequence. It's not popular. Human government um, is what's nicknamed by theologians as common grace. Now you have salvific grace, the one that we hear about with Jesus, you know, law and grace. That has to do with... Uh, Breathing air, rain, nature, things like that. Through We have grace through Him. But common grace and salvific grace kind of have two different thought processes behind them. Um, so I think this is the end right here. Yeah, so sometimes we're told by other governing, um, we're told by governing authorities, by our leaders, by our <laughs> president, people sometimes, that are untrue. Some things are completely wrong. And we know that. All of us here know that. We've been led by the gatekeeper. And I'm going to close it out here. Um, my, my church that I came from did an amazing series called The Gatekeeper. And they mentioned three ways we get information. This is noteworthy. This is good. We get the gatekeeper, you know, TVs, school systems, political realms, religious realm, political, and educational. Those are the three. School systems teach our kids. What did, what did Hitler say? Gain control of the minds of the kids and what? He gained control of the world. The gatekeepers, number one, school. Number two, religious, churches. Somebody's a good speaker, handsome guy, <laughs> and, and talks really well. Not me, somebody else, right? You tend to listen to them. Matter of fact, my mom, wonderful woman, just because my dad's 86, sometimes she's like, yeah, well, Bob says uh, the only way to the father is not the son. Yeah, he doesn't say that, but I mean, you might trust your husband or wife and think, well, they said it, so I'm going to adopt it. You shouldn't do that. You should go to Scripture. Because just because somebody's in their 70s, 80s, or been doing it forever, it doesn't mean their authority is more than Scripture. You don't just trust somebody because they're wearing an outfit. Ever. The ways that, that the gatekeeper control, the Bible calls them portals, porters. Remember the, uh, I think Pastor Troy did a teaching on the flock, uh, the, the, the guy, would he was the door uh, when they'd go out in the wilderness when he had a sheep, I'm trying to get my mind around it, the sheepfold, he would lay in the doorway, he'd become the door when they were out in the wilderness over my dead body, right? It had to go through him. Everything that we see and hear, I want you to remember this, our ears, God uses, our eyes, the enemy uses. I'm not saying there's cases that aren't different, but usually the enemy uses our eyes. Yeah, I like that. He says to circumcise your ear. Cut away the flesh. Hear the way I hear, not the way the flesh hears. The gatekeepers control our eyes and ears. Think about it. The political, the religious, and the educational. Schools teach our kids. We should be teaching them. I don't mean like all the curriculum, but if they're learning evolution, bring them home and talk to them. They shouldn't be controlling what our kids think. Political stuff definitely shouldn't be because that can get you all messed up. Schools, political, and church. Church, 
my job, Pastor Troy's job, should never be to teach you Scripture as much to lead you to Scripture. He's going to lead you. He's an under-shepherd. Pastors are under-shepherds. Jesus is the shepherd, intercessing for us right now, the right hand of the Father. Everything that we get, Pastor Troy, should be filtered through the Word of God, like Paul said, and then take it to the Father. Don't trust Him. I'm not saying don't not trust Him. I'm saying don't use Him as your final authority. Right? You go where you trust. Whatever He says, look it up. Read about it. Let the Holy Spirit give you the answer. Me too. Schools, political, religious. And so I want to end with this. Um, we've been led by the gatekeeper. That's the problem. The gatekeeper should be our Bible. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to read. I didn't realize I had this right here. But uh, the statement, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. It's attributed to Adolf Hitler in 1935 rally as part of the Nazi efforts to indoctrinate the youth. And in closing, I want to say, I'm not saying that our government's perfect or good or that we should like what they do. I am saying that God's put them in place for us to respect authority, whether we like it or not. And rather than going around talking about, which I've done, our leaders, why aren't we just praying for our leaders? That's my question. Maybe if we prayed for them, things would change. I mean, generally pray for them instead of complaining about them. Something to think about. So, that being said, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I'm humbly before you right now. I'm asking that that um, anything that, that was said tonight, Father God, that, that it get filtered through you through the Holy Spirit and that anything I said that wasn't something you had planned to be in the ears of the listener, Father, you'll filter it out and destroy it, get rid of it. Father God, I just ask that you bless the ears of the people here. Father, keep us pursuing you. Keep us in your word that we don't just have Bibles on our coffee tables. Dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. Father, that Bible becomes a place that our families gather at the kitchen table when our kids are with us, that our phones will be upside down and we'll read the word together and we'll use that time to commune like tonight, Father, that we'll talk about you, that your word will become the center focus of our family life. Father, our government starts at our house, at our kitchen table. Our government starts at our kitchen table because we're raising up children to become adults, to become leaders, become world leaders, and Father, in the wrong house, become world uh, anarchists. Father, and I ask that tonight, anything that was said tonight, that you will bless the ears and that someone will get something out of this and we'll have understanding when we go tonight. Father, bless everyone tonight where they go be their forerunner, their rear guard. Please, Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to stand in the pulpit and to deliver your word, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.